church one more time. Can we celebrate that he is risen? people are here. I want to hear. Are you here? I want to hear. I want to hear you. I want to hear you. In the, in the sanctuary. I want to hear you from here. In the sanctuary. Are you here sanctuary? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I mean, there's so many folks here. The sanctuary is packed. and so many of you had to sit over there. I also thank you, thank you, thank you for your flexibility and understanding of this great thing that God is doing. And for those of you that are online, I want to take a moment just to address you. Uh, for some reason, or the God has allowed us not just to connect online with people right here in the Burleson, DFW, Fort Worth area where we reside, but all over the United States of America and a few places over the world. And we are just humbled that you would allow us from afar to be connected with you uh, in this way on this Easter. And we, and we thank you for joining us. And we would love to build a relationship with you, all you who are watching online as well. All, all on this, this very moment, but also during the week as, as you catch up with us. Uh, if you're here for the very first time, you came at a great time because for us, the most important weekend of the year is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the celebrate of the resurrection, and this is it. This is the Super Bowl. This is the Masters. This is the World Series. This is everything combined on this particular day, and we're just so honored, uh, all the great churches that are around here, and there's so many uh, that you would choose to allow us to be a part of your Easter experience. Uh, if we've not met, uh, my name is Rick, uh, and I am a sinner saved by grace. Yeah. And uh, I have issues. Every once in a while I hear people call me pastor, but really that's not who I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I have issues. And the people who know the most that I have issues are these people right here on the screen. First of all, this group right here. This is my wife right here. I'm a husband. Um, this is my wife. And she calls, she's the only one that can call me husband, and she does that. And then I have three sons, and if you can't, I don't go, don't, 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 just, yeah, I'll just do this song, because, 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 because these three daughter-in-laws that you see right here, um, I, I love my sons, and man, they chose wisely. Those, those, those girls, I love them so much, like my own flesh and blood, and they're the only ones that can call me kind of dad. And then, yeah, go to the other, and you can stay there as long as you want. And these are my grandkids. These are not your. I can put my grandkids on the screen. You can't, okay? So I just want to stand here and look at them for a little while. And these are the th my three, Lennox and Ryder and Dallas Ruth, the baby just born, and they can call me Papa. A few folks around here call me Pastor, but they call me names that identify who I really am. And if you go and ask them, does your husband, does your dad, does your father-in-law, does your papa have issues, they will all say, oh, yeah, he has issues. <laughs> so I'll just come clean and tell you the truth right now. So you don't have to ask them, I have issues. I got these things in my life that I just can't seem to fix and overcome by myself. And I have found in my life, just somehow in my life, that having a relationship with this man named Jesus and following this man named Jesus. And the more I hang out with him and follow him, that he helps me learn how to overcome my issues and, and to deal with my issues, to be the man that that woman and those three sons and those three daughter-in-laws and those three grandkids need me to be. And without Jesus, I fail them repeatedly. And so I just kind of, I'd love to meet, that's who I am, I, and I don't know who you are, okay? I really don't know you, but so if you're new, I would love to meet you, really who you are, not just the title, no, not just your title, whatever your title may be, I, I'd be out in the crossing afterwards, I, I'd love just to meet you and get to know something about you, and uh, I'd love to do that, thanks for coming. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Acts chapter 2, if you're that kind, over in the sanctuary, there's some right there uh, in the pews, Tree Worth, I think we have some down there for you that you can grab as well, down there at the night shelter, you can do that. Uh, you can draw it. You can do it online. You can do your, your message notes. You might have a hard copy. We probably ran out. Uh, you might want to find it on your, the app as well if you have done so. And we'll get there in a second. I'd like to open in prayer. Uh, good morning, God. Happy Easter to you. We just acknowledge, God, that, that you're awesome. You're great. I mean, there's nobody here in the flesh on earth that can compare to you. And uh, we, we just thank you, God, for loving us so much uh, that you sent your son into the world. 
uh, to be among us and to live among us, to take our sin on the cross for us, and that you would raise him from the dead, that we ourselves might have new life on this earth, but beyond this earth, God, into this thing called eternity. We're just so grateful for that, God. And God, we ask you to speak as we open your word. You, you speak a fresh word about this subject to our souls. God, you would not just speak to our head. You would not just speak to our bodies or our hearts, but you would, touch, you would speak to our souls. You would, you would touch us in those places where nobody else can touch. Touch us in places where our spouse can't touch, our kids can't touch, our grandkids can't touch. It's just a place, God, that only you can touch. And so I ask you to do that this morning, God. And God, we also pause in the middle of our Easter celebration uh, to think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who their lives have been disrupted by so much death, removed from their homes and their places of business and their places of education and going to school, opportunities to play sports, all those sort of things God just ripped away. And God, we pray for the souls of those and the hearts of those who have made decisions that have led to this end result that's just nothing but destruction. And God, and we pray that someone will introduce them to Jesus. That they'll come face to face with the resurrected Jesus and will take them to their knees and they'll become aware what it truly means to be loving and forgiving and merciful and to love people and to let down your pride and desire for power. And they would repent and ask for forgiveness God and they would begin to make decisions that would set people free from death that they could experience the resurrection God we pray this would be so but God right now God we return our attention to our own lives and our own families that you would speak a word for each of us that we take home with us that would make a difference I ask you to do this in Jesus name amen I want to take just a few moments here to explain to you why the resurrection is so important and why Easter is so important. And then if you're so inclined, I'm going to give you just a chance to respond. And you're going to be able to respond right where you're seated. And I want to begin in this way, whether you're in the sanctuary, you're, you're online, you're, hopefully you got someone there in the room with you, or you're traveling, or if you're down at True Worth, that here in the house, here in this room, the central, would you please turn to someone and I want you to say, What's new? Ready? On the count of three, you're going to turn and say, hey, what's new? Ready? One, two, three, say it. Yeah, what's new? Now, when you, when you say that to someone, what's new, really what you're saying, you're saying, hey, what's exciting going on in your life? Hey, what's changing? What's happening? What, what do you feel good about? What are you looking forward to? What, what's new in your life. Now, if you were to ask my youngest and his beloved uh, what's new in their life right now, that would be James and Corinne. You saw their photo a minute ago. I will tell you, here's what they would say. They would say, new life, new baby, new diapers, new sleep patterns, new jobs. They both got brand new jobs. And just this past Thursday, they signed on buying their first house and moved in yesterday. Can you say everything's new? Can you say new bills? Yeah, if you were to ask them what's new, they would say everything, and all at once, everything has become brand new. I mean, everything brand new. And if you were to go ask them right now, or you see them around, and you ask them what's new, it's possible they could hug you or hit you. <laughs> they could smile or start crying. They might even go to sleep because they're not getting any. <laughs> But if you ask them what's new, I promise you their response will be everything. Have you ever asked a bored, cynical person, someone who's kind of, you know, just kind of an old crub mudgeon, maybe this is you, you know who you are, what's new? And the response is nothing, not much, same old, same old. There's an expression of that in the Bible over here in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, that's, that's almost the exact same thing, that's the same response right there of someone who kind of has that sort of worldview that there's nothing good going on. And I'll find it right here. You give me a page, we'll put it on the screen up here. In fact, I'll just go with it on the screen. Will you put it on the screen? I'm not even going to look for it. Yeah, all things are wearisome. 
More than one can say, the eye has never enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. Now, there's nothing new, nothing new, nothing new under the sun, nothing. Some 2,000 years ago, there was 12 ordinary guys, just like us in here. Some of them liked to fish a lot. A couple of them were businessmen. Some did taxes. Some were brothers. And if you were to go to these 12 guys and ask them what's new, they would be like what this scripture just said or what you would normally say, ah, not much, nothing new, same old, same old, until this guy named Jesus comes along and he speaks their name. And when he says their name, he says, I would like for you to come follow me. And so they walked away from the stuff and they started following this guy named Jesus. And then from that point forward, every time you asked them what's new, they said, Jesus. They say, it's amazing what this guy does. Every day, every day he does something new. He clears the temple. He uh, healed people with blindness. He touched the leper. Who does that? He touched the leper. He parted with the tax collectors. He prayed with the prostitute. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children on the side of a mountain with a few Happy Meals because Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. (laughs) He had to use the Happy Meal. I mean, every time you asked him, they say, what's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? It was just, man, Jesus, everything's new because you ought to see all the stuff that he's doing. And then one Friday, they asked the same question. One Friday, what's new? And they said, he's dead. It's over. They killed him. Saturday, you ask them again, what's new? First time since they've been following Jesus, they had this answer again, nothing Nothing new under the sun. Same old, same old. And then Sunday, you see them walking down the street, and you ask them what's new. They say, everything. The tomb is empty. He's alive. Sin has been forgiven. Death has been defeated. Hell loses and hope wins. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Everything is new. And that resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave, somehow, I don't know how, but somehow it got into those 12 guys. It went out of Jesus, it goes into these 12 guys, and all of a sudden, everything becomes new for them. So much so, this guy Peter starts talking about it. He just has to talk about it. So over here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, on this day that we call the day of Pentecost now, it says in verse 5, Peter stands up to talk. He says, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Here's what's happened in Jerusalem. They're having a big celebration. It's a huge party. And it's so big and so huge, everybody is jam-packed, kind of like Easter, right? The building's jam-packed. Everybody's jam-packed there into Jerusalem. Nobody's working. Nobody's getting any work done. It's kind of like used to be on the opening day for the Texas Rangers. Used to be on opening day for the Texas Rangers when they were good. No work got done. Lots of work get done on after opening day now. But no work is getting done at all. Such a huge day. And then Peter, verse 14, Peter stands up with the 11, and he raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. I want you to stop right there. I want to make sure you understand this. This is just a few weeks after what's happening here, after they arrested Jesus and they crucified him. And when they arrested Jesus, the 12 disciples, 11, Judas is aside, especially Peter, they run and hide, scared to death like little kids at the middle of the night. Scared spitless. Peter not only ran and hid, they asked him, do you know who Jesus is? Not once, but three times. Nope, not me. Never knew the guy. So now, right here, 
same city, same crowd that crucified and said, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. For the same people, same Peter, but really totally different Peter. Because everything's new for Peter. Everything's different. And he teaches, he's going to tell them what's new. Verse 22, fellow Israelites, in other words, people of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And they go, yeah, 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 we know, we saw him. Uh, We heard him teach. We were right there. We saw him heal. Yep, we know. We saw him lead. Yep, we watched him. We know it's true. Yes, we heard about this guy, Jesus. He goes on, verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. Let me repeat that. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, please don't miss this moment. A few weeks ago, Peter ran scared to death. He went and hid for his own life. Now he's talking in front of the group of people that he believes many publicly had whipped and lashed and asked for the crucifixion of killing Jesus. And not only that, in a few weeks, Peter himself, because of this sort of speech, this sort of message, put in prison, going to be killed He tells them, you killed him. Can you imagine the courage that it took? Can you imagine what's changed in this fearful little scaredy cat? To speak the truth in love, to speak the last 10%, if you know what I'm talking about, if you've been around here for a while. Along with the wicked men, which are the Roman soldiers. And then he goes on. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was, somebody say that word, because it was what? I I can't hear you. Because it was what? Impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Impossible. Verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. In your notes, if you're taking notes, the resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in human history. One of the unique aspects of Christianity is that we know the exact day that it started. We know exactly when Christianity started began. This is not true of all religions and philosophies. To our knowledge, this is not true of Judaism. This is not true of uh, Islam. This is not true of, of Buddhism. But we know that Christianity began in a certain moment, in a certain city, at a certain place, with a certain man. One day, Saturday, it did not exist. Sunday, it did exist. Because he was risen from the dead. What's new now? Everything's new. Everything. Christianity did not arise from some sort of ethical teaching. It did not evolve out of some sort of meaningful philosophy. Christianity did not come into being because of wishful thinking, not because of mistaken autopsy report on a corpse. It came into a being because a man, a flesh and blood man, fully God but fully human, was crucified and killed on the cross. And on the third day, God physically and literally brought him back to life. The disciples knew exactly what happened to Jesus. They make no bombs about this is what happened. Years ago, there was a pastor who was wrestling with this issue publicly, and uh, one of his church members did not like his response to it. So the guy wrote out something uh, to a a magazine called Christianity Today, and here's what they asked, and here's what the man responded. Can you put this out there? Hey, our preacher said on Easter, Jesus swooned on the cross And the disciples, they just nurtured Jesus back to health. Hey, what do you think? Sincerely bewildered. Here's what Wisby's response. Here's what he said. 
Dear bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 30. This is not literal opportunity here. I'm just saying here. <laughs> beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for three hours. Run a spear through his heart. Embalm him. Put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. Some people, maybe some of you, somehow think this, this empty tomb thing because the disciples were in a pre-scientific era and didn't understand science. That they just had this myth. They missed Jesus so much that mystically in their spirit, they felt like they saw him because they missed him so much. They sensed that he was there. And it was just kind of became a myth and a legend that Jesus was alive. Whatever you think about this, make no mistake that those who witnessed it and those who write in the scriptures believe it was a physical, actual resurrection. And here's why I know this could be is true. There's a problem with that argument, a myth or legend. Who allows himself to be martyred, persecuted, or killed for a myth? Or a legend that they, they know is not true. And that's exactly what the disciples did. Historical record shows they allowed themselves to be martyred and persecuted and killed for their faith. Who does that for a myth? No one. And the scriptures are full of these examples of an, a white eyewitness account of the resurrection of Jesus. Over here in Mark chapter 15, I'll give you one little example. Mark chapter 15. Uh, Mark himself says, there was a man named Simon. Simon, he was carrying the cross. He, he was there. Uh, Jesus is carrying his cross to, to the top of the mountain. A certain man from Cyrene, Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, he was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross of Jesus the rest of the way. Now, my question is, why would this Mark, writing this one verse, put three names, three names in this verse? Let me tell you why. When he's going to go write the gospel of Mark, he needs reference, he needs sources, he goes to Simon. Hey, Simon, tell me about your experience of carrying the cross of Jesus up the hill. Simon had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. So later on, after Simon has died, you could go fact check with the two sons to make sure what he said was true. And the Bible's full of that. When you're reading ancient literature, they put names in the text like you and I do footnotes for a document or an essay so you can go fact check the historical reality that is true. And that is why Peter himself said such boldly, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all eyewitnesses of it. Not a mystical feeling not wishful, hopeful feeling. We saw him with our own eyes. Then Peter goes on. Verse 37. When the people heard this, the scriptures say, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, what shall we do? Cut, cut to the heart. What is cut, cut to the heart? Cut to the heart means, whoa, man, I missed the opportunity in your notes, number two, two, you're taking notes about the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is the greatest opportunity of my whole life. So, sometime here ago, I was visiting with a gentleman who just bought a piece of property over on Fox Lane. I, 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 I drive down Fox Lane, if you're familiar with Burson, uh, going to the office, going home I, multiple times, and there's so much property over there, and I'm always dreaming about property, uh, you know, kind of do, do some investment or something. I'm busy with this guy who just bought a property. He bought it for $400,000, and I said, you got to be kidding me, because right before the pandemic, right before the pandemic, you could buy that piece of property for $125,000, and I didn't do it. <laughs> when he told me he bought it for four hundred, dollars can I tell you, I was cut to the heart. <laughs> I mean, oh, missed opportunity. I cannot believe I missed it. And that's exactly what they're saying in the scripture. They're going, oh, I cannot believe it. 
Getting to know Jesus was the greatest opportunity to follow him, to hear him, to be with him, to know him. It was the greatest opportunity in the world, and I missed it. I totally missed it. And they missed it. More than missed it. They killed him. They crucified him. They mocked him. They spat at him. While Jesus was walking around, they were throwing their life away, just consumed with pursuing money, just consumed with success, consumed with their reputation, consumed with their physical health, consumed with their own security, consumed with their comfort, consumed with, with partying, consumed with playing, consumed with sports. Maybe even consumed with loving cats. Who would do that? You just kind of drift into it. You don't intend to be, you just drift into it. That's all I can do, you just drift into it. And all of a sudden, the cat owns you, and you don't own the cat. And all I'm saying, church, is that sometimes so many of us, like them, we're just so consumed with other stuff, and we just drift away, and we miss the main thing. You miss the greatest opportunity in the whole world. You miss it. And the disciple said, is it too late? The crowd said, it's too late to death. What, what, what do we do? What do we do? Is it too late? Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter responds in verse 38. Here, no, it's not too late. And it's not too late yet. All you got to do is repent and be baptized. That's what he said. It's not too late. No, you, you, right now, you can repent and be baptized. Now, what does repentance mean? Big churchy word, I know. In your notes, two or three things about repentance. Repentance is admitting I need a do-over. That's all it is. It's, it's admitting, I need a fresh start. I need a mulligan. I need a new opportunity. I need another beginning. I need a chance. I admit I have been blind. I cannot manage my life by myself. I cannot manage my marriage by myself. I cannot manage my kids by myself. I cannot manage my health by myself. I cannot manage my eating by myself. I cannot manage my sexuality by myself. I cannot manage my addiction by myself. I cannot imagine my depression by myself. I cannot imagine my issues, my stuff by myself. I can't get out of my own way. I need a do-over. That's repentance. I cannot handle my own will. I surrender my will to the one who has perfect will. That's repentance. I cannot handle myself. About six weeks into Dallas, my dating relationship. I was invited, we were invited to go out to eat with the pastor of our local church, a place where I worked. Uh, I was a youth pastor, and he just wanted to get to know my wife, and I'm going to my, my wife-to-be. They thought, because I, I was about six weeks in, and I already told him I'm about to pop the question. Six weeks, I'm about to pop the question, and I'm still trying to impress this woman, okay? And so we go to Underwoods, which is a popular barbecue place, was in Wichita Falls some 200 years ago. It was a popular barbecue place. And so I make the mistake, I make a couple of mistakes in this out to eat. First of all is I order barbecue ribs. Second mistake is I wear a white shirt. And so I'm trying to impress this woman. They're trying to meet her and everything, visit with her, this couple. And I take rib number one, and typical Rick, I drop it, and it bounces off my white shirt onto the floor. No problem. I just quickly cover the, the mark up on my shirt, and I go to rib number two, and I take it to my mouth, and I drop it, and it bounces off my white shirt, another place, and into my lap. Huh. So I take rib number three, and I just get as much sauce on it as I can, and I start wiping it all over my shirt. <laughs> There's no sense in hiding now. This is me. I'm a slob. I get food on me when I eat. I just tell you, I have issues when it comes to eating and everything. This is me. Now, uh, I asked Dallas to to marry me, and she said yes, and so uh, this pastor and his wife wanted to invite us over to celebrate, so they invite us over to, for a meal one more time, and so we come over to their house, we're going to eat, and we're going to eat in the dining room, they have white carpet, and we went down to sit down to eat, I noticed they had put newspaper under my chair. <laughs> Repentance 
is admitting you need newspaper under your chair, that you can't stop messing up and cleaning up yourself. You just can't help yourself. There are some places in your life you just make a mess, and you make a mess on other people too. And I need a do-over. Repentance is in your nose. Secondly, it's an act of humility. I will tell you, church, it is an act of humility when you say to the family, uh, I need some newspaper under my chair. I know I keep messing up. I keep saying the wrong thing. I keep doing it. You know why it's an act of humility? And you know why the family's relieved? Because they already know. They know before you know. And when an act of humility, you acknowledge that you know it, there's something that happens in a family and relationships when you know what they already know and you admit it. It's just, a, it's just an act of humility. And thirdly, it's an act of trust and grace. It's, I'm, a, I'm just trusting in Jesus, for, of the forgiveness of Jesus, of the mercy of Jesus, of the goodness of Jesus. I'm just trusting that he will be my friend. I'm trusting that he will guide me. I'm trusting that he will help me. I'm trusting, I'm trusting, I'm trusting that he will do something new, that he will make everything different within me. I'm just trusting that he will. The Apostle Paul put it this way over here in 2 Corinthians. He said, that anyone who said in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone. It's done with. It's over. And the new has come. And everything is new. And that is the good news on this Easter. That you can, when I ask you the question, what's new? You can say everything because of the risen Christ you've given your life to him. And then it says, the visible expression of repentance is baptism. And what is baptism? Baptism, I'm just going to give you two or three things what baptism is. First of all, baptism, it's an outward expression of an inward reality. My issues are not out here. My issues are inside. It's in my soul. It's in my stinking thinking. It's in the motives of my heart. It's what's happening in here in my gut. It's my inner being. And so baptism is an outward expression of acknowledging Secondly, in your notes, that baptism is a spiritual cleansing. That I need the, my inside cleaned up, that water is part of it. Water on the outside. And the water doesn't do anything powerful by itself, sure. Water itself is just a symbol, but we all need it. You can't live without water. Water, hydrate, 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 hydrate. Cleanse, cleanse, cleanse me, cleanse me, cleanse me. And so baptism is that symbol. And people did that in the ancient world. When they heard this message of the risen Jesus, people actually did that. In fact, in verse 41, it says, it says those who accepted his, his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number on that very day. On that day. And I want you to notice what didn't happen. They didn't say, listen, oh my gosh, really, I can't, I cut to the heart, cut to the heart, I can't believe this. Man, I can't, that really, I, it's not too late, I still have that opportunity. Hey, I need to go home and talk to my spouse about it. I need to talk to my husband, I need to talk to my wife, I need to talk to my, I need, I need to wait till it's more convenient. I need to know till I understand everything, till I got everything figured out. They didn't do that. It said e immediately they were baptized. That's how he ended his message. I want to end this message the same way Peter ended that message. And I want to give anyone here who can hear my voice, sanctuary, online, truer, center, to make a decision this morning that you want to follow this man Jesus this resurrected Jesus, not religion. I'm not talking about religion, and I'm not talking about just going to church. A relationship with the resurrected Jesus. And I want to be baptized. And I want to give you a chance to make that decision this morning and to be baptized next weekend. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a QR code up here. I want you to put this QR code up here, and you can just click on that QR code, and you're going to click on it. Get your phone, open up your, 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 photo, your, your photo app, and boom, just take a picture of that. It's going to take you to where it's going to be your name, your name, and there's a couple of contact ways, and somebody's going to call you and set you up. So next weekend, next weekend, you're going to come back, man, I'm ready. I'm not putting this off. Now's the time I am ready to be baptized and to take this next step in my journey with Jesus. I'm ready to do that. I've been putting it off. 
And some of you are thinking right now, well, Pastor, don't I need to take a class? You're taking it right now. This is the class. This month, this is the class. Well, Pastor, I got questions. I mean, I got questions. I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm ready to say that. I mean, what if I was baptized as a baby? Is that okay? Do I have to be baptized again? No, if you're baptized as a baby, you don't have to be baptized again. You don't have to. You might still need to make a public profession of your faith and have the baptism of the cross put upon your forehead with a symbol of water. You know, that would be the case. What if I was baptized in another denomination? Do, does that count? Do I need to be baptized again now that I'm here? No, listen, there's only one church, a lot of outposts. There's only one table. There's only one Lord, one Jesus, and there's only one baptize, only one baptism. No, you don't need to be baptized repeated times. The more water you have, they're not going to clean you up anymore. It's your soul that needs cleansing, I'm just saying. So you don't have to do that. But it could be. It could be. It could be. It could be. It could be you drifting so far away. You turn your back so far that you need to do something that symbolizes, no, I'm getting back on track. I'm getting my marriage back on track. I'm getting my, I, I finally with this addiction. I, I got to do something. I need to surrender. to. I need to surrender. And then maybe you do need to be baptized. And you can click on that, and we can next week. Don't be putting it off. Next week, we can make that. Well, Pastor, I'm not sure if I want to. Pastor, I believe, and I have this faith, but, but it's, it's private. It's just between me and Jesus. I love him, but I don't want anybody else to know. It's just, that's embarrassing. In your notes, here's the final thing I would say, that, the, that baptism is a way of making my relationship with God public. I want everyone to know. I want everyone to know that God loves me, that I know that God loves me, and... I want everyone to know that I love God. I want everybody to know. Can you imagine? Can you imagine when Dallas and I got engaged? Can you imagine when we got engaged? If I said, and we did get engaged, by the way, and we did get married. I said, honey, now that we're engaged, hey, I just really don't want anybody to know. And when we get married, I want it to be private. Just you, me, and the pastor. Nobody else. In fact, I want it to be so private, I don't even think I'll wear a ring. Just make it between you and me. This is our relationship. Nobody else know. And I don't, I, in fact, I don't want anybody to know that I'm married, even though we're going to be married. Just rest assured, we're going to be married, but just don't tell anybody. How do you think that's going to fly? <laughs> I will tell you, there would be three less kids in the world right now. <laughs> if that had been that conversation, I make you that promise, there would be three less for sure. Why is that so important? Because there's something that happens when you go public. When you go public, you say, listen, I want everyone to know this is my woman, this is my God, this is my family. There's something that, that bonds you together. And when you say, God, I want everyone to know that I'm following Jesus. I love him. This is my man. This is, he's my first priority and my first love. So I want to ask you again, if you've never done that and you need to take that step on the QR code, sanctuary, wherever, just, just, just. Going public, something happens. And I thought some of you might need a little help with this. Don't know what a baptism looks like. So we're going to show you right now what a baptism looks like, okay? We're going to let you see one. Just, just for an example, so you can see one. Okay? All right. Put it in your hand. Can we tell what's about to happen? When Hansel comes up out of that water, I want to hear clapping and cheering and foot stomping and yelling and he is risen and everything's new like I've never heard before. You got that church sanctuary? I want to hear you all the way over here in the center and I want to hear you online folks too, okay? You got it? Because here's what's about to happen, okay? Here we go. Get ready. Get ready. Hansel, do you accept Jesus, repent of your sin, believe in Jesus, the Lord and Savior of your life? Do you? Do you want to be baptized? Your full Christian name. Hansel Alexander Ramon, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Stand up, buddy. Hansel watched the news, he'd say everything. 
want you to stop one, stop one second. I'm tired of seeing so many people that I love stay stuck. Stay stuck. Same old, same old. Same old marriage. Same old family stuff. Same old issues. Same old stuff. When right at your fingertips is the answer. And that is a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. We're going to put the QR code up here one more time, one more time. And if you've not done so yet, please, please, I just would urge you, please, to consider. Just, just take a little picture of that QR code. I think they're up there. Yeah, right now, I'll send your name. Make it just name. Somebody will contact you this week and next week. And I'm going to up the ante. And I know we've got a bunch of people in the house, but I'm going to up the ante. If there's anybody here this morning, right now, that you say, I'm not going to be here next week because I live in Timbuktu. You just got to be baptized this morning. I'll meet you at the fountain. And you can walk away from here. Everything new already this morning right now. And I'll get in the water with you. So, everybody, Sanctuary Center online, I'm going to ask you a question. What's new? You know the answer, right? You know the answer, right? Somebody tell me. What's new? My God is able to save it.